Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us here at WF, WFSU Public Media for this special program on the Vote 2020. As many of you know, this year is the 100 year anniversary of the women's suffrage movement here in the United States. It's been 100 years since we women got the right to vote, actually since we women earned the right to vote through the 19th Amendment. Joining us today here, we have League of Women Voters Vice President Jessica Lowe Minor. We have WFSU's executive producer, Suzanne Smith. We have WFSU reporter Blaze Ganey, and we're also joined here today by WFSU correspondent Steve Bosque. Thank you all so much for joining us here for this special conversation about voting and the first 100 years for women and 100 years on. Um, so I am your host and your moderator today. I'm Lynn Hatter. I'm the news director here at WFSU Public Media. I really appreciate everyone for being able to come and join us here today. Thank you. Um, Suzanne, you have been spearheading um, a project that has really been focusing on looking at how our area is commemorating this anniversary. Can you talk a little bit about what WFSU Public Media has been doing to mark this occasion? Well, we had the wonderful opportunity from American Experience, which airs on PBS stations, including WFSU Public Media. Um, to, um, they're going to be showing a new documentary called The Vote, which is a two-part documentary. It starts tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, and um, it focuses on the 70-year fight for the uh, right for women to uh, be able to vote. And that's sort of what spearheaded some of this work um, that we were able to do. And so we um, not only are going to be doing a uh, screening of some of the segments from that, because it's a four-hour documentary over two, uh, you know, two hours per night. We'll be doing a screening later in July and then um, of, of segments from that. And that's going to be July 23rd at 7 uh, p.m. Eastern. And it's going to be an online screening, so nobody has to leave their home. And uh, and then uh, we're also been doing stories. Uh, radio and television have been both working on stories uh, that uh, where TV has been focusing on some more of the historical aspects, like we did a story on the Rightfully Hers exhibit at the Florida Historic Capitol. Um, it uh, includes artifacts from um, Ronald's book and Senator Lauren book. Um, they collect a lot of suffrage items. Um, and because of COVID-19, not only did we have to change our original plans for the screening, we had um, we were talking with the historic capital and we decided that um, we would do a 360 video tour of the exhibit since they can't have people coming in for tours. So um, that is online. We've got a website, wfsu.org slash the vote, which has these elements plus a whole bunch of stories um, that radio has been working on as well. And, uh, and, and that's taking it more of the current time period and um, toss that over, I guess, to, to, to Blaze. <laughs> Hey, Blaze, hey. how you doing this morning? Hey, how's it going? Really well. Um, Blaze, I know that your reporting has been focused more on current issues with respect to voting. Um, here in Florida, one of the big storylines that we've been following now since 2018 was the passage of Amendment 4, which restored the right to vote to most former felons. But um, as you've been reporting now for about the past year and a half, there's a catch. Um, talk a little bit about what your stories have been examining and what is the current state of voting in Florida for felons? So, uh Basically, my story has been either following the lawsuit or following actual uh, people on the ground, felons that are trying to get their rights back to vote. I've interviewed a, a few felons who've done just that. They voted um, here in 2020. Uh, but the, the catch, like you were saying, is that they must pay off their fines, fees and restitution. Now, whether or not that was what voters wanted in 2018, uh, that's what they're trying to decide in court, essentially. Now, um, you've had some judges agree and say all felons should be able to vote without having to pay these fines, fees, and restitution um, before voting um, because of the 24th <laughs> Amendment, which is a, a poll tax. You can't make somebody pay to vote. But uh, right now, currently, that's all on hold and going to be appealed up in Atlanta in the 11th District Court um, of Appeals. But it's been a, a, a two years now since it's passed and it took a while to implement the law, but 
the implementing law is what a lot of uh, people who are on the grassroots organization have an issue with in ACLU and a lot of other uh, voting rights advocates group are trying to make sure that felons can vote. Um, as of right now, it looks like if they paid off all fines, fees, and restitution, then they're good to go. If they haven't, then that things get a little iffy. And for most of them, um, not sure people listening here, uh, it's not really easy a lot of times for felons to uh, maintain a job or, you know, definitely feed their families and then also pay extra bills. And so this is a sort of what I'm looking into is that life and how they, some do manage to do it, some don't. And when legislation or lawsuit will be cleared and whether or not the felons will have to pay the fines and fees is still up in the air and uh, will most likely be decided shortly before uh, the election this year, um, which I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, depending on timing, if I them to vote this uh, presidential election, they may have to uh, wait. You know, Blaze, the, the last piece of, of your series, um, you talk specifically about the impact of this on women, um, how women are kind of the fastest growing group of people um, who are becoming incarcerated and how, you know, here we are a hundred years after the women's suffrage movement. They're also sort of the group of people who are losing that right to vote um, the fastest. Jessica, I want to I pivot to you here. You know, you represent the League of Women Voters. You all are very active in elections issues. Um, what are you all seeing on the ground and how is the league sort of navigating this landscape? We're now only a month and a half away from a primary and November is right around the corner. Yeah, so one thing I would say is that even though as an organization we are in our 100th year, of course, as we mentioned at the beginning of the call, it's the 100th uh, centennial of the 19th Amendment, you know, we are definitely seeing a situation where voting rights are very fraught, um, you know, essentially with COVID-19, with, um, you know, court battles, such as what we're hearing now over Amendment 4, you know, there is a definite um, push to limit voting rights or make voting access more difficult. Um, and the League of Women Voters is one of those organizations that's really fighting to uh, make it easier for voters to make their voices heard, to make it convenient, to make sure that uh, people don't mm -hmm. have essentially bureaucratic regulations that stand in the way between them and their voice being heard on election day. So we are, um, of course, excited about the fact that this is our 100th year, but are definitely seeing, you know, uh, even uh, stronger opposition to voting rights in a way that you know, it's frankly un-American and undemocratic. So, um, you know, we're in some ways excited, but um, the, the real story here is that there is an effort to make voting less accessible. And uh, that's something that's, you know, a huge step back for our country. Steve, you know, I want to kind of pivot here off what Jessica said, um, the difficulties um, that are facing Floridians come November with respect to to COVID-19, um, right now you have a big fight that is emerging over vote by mail. Florida has been sort of a vote by mail state. It's very popular here, but we're now beginning to kind of see backlash over this. And I'm wondering, you know, you've been covering Florida government now for decades. You know, how is this playing into some of the emergent issues that we're seeing um, ahead of November? Well, thanks, Lynn. Um all over the state, election supervisors are promoting voting by mail like never before. Um, and uh, I looked at the numbers just this morning and, um, you know, we're seeing a record number of people asking for vote by, by mail ballots for the August 18th primary. What we don't know is how many of these folks will actually vote. Uh, both, despite what you've heard from the president of the United States, uh, you know, uh, that voting by mail uh, is an incentive for voter fraud. The view is not shared by people who are in the elections trenches in this state, the election supervisors. They are strong mm -hmm. proponents of voting by mail. And, um, and they're trying to do everything they can to get people to vote by mail. Um, and uh, 
So what's what what we're seeing is um, a lot more requests. What we don't know is how many of these folks are actually going to vote. And that's why now the second stage, of this, which is so important, which is that both political parties in this state, um, and traditionally the Republicans have been a little bit better at this than the Democrats have, they, what they refer to as they chase vote by mail blood requesters. They, 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 how these with text messages and say, you know, Smith, you can vote by mail ballot, the supervisor elected 10 days ago. Uh, we know she had it. Can we help? Can we, uh, can we help you? You know, get the ballot back to its rightful destination. So um, that's an important element. Um, I wanted to mention that that um, that, that there, there's there's you know there's a certain weariness of extraordinaries I'm finding because of unsure territory in the state. Uh, Florida is as well, and. Congress set aside uh, a lot of money for under the CARES Act for counties to make election improvements. Uh, and that money is not yet in the hands of election supervisors um, in Florida. The first big wave of vote by mail ballots is going out this coming Thursday, July 9th. And um, uh, many of the supervisors have gotten so much more proactive in, in educating the public, working with the mainstream media. They, they want photo opportunities of the ballots, you know, going into the trucks and going to the post office and so forth. So uh, it's, it's good to see. Um, then, of course, we're going to have in many counties, we're going to have at least, at least eight or nine early voting. And in many, in some of the big counties, 14 days, um, and that's going to be um, in addition to all of this focus on on voting by mail. So it's a really good thing to see. But but um, but it'd be great. The supervisors say if they could get that money from the feds to make these last minute improvements to their infrastructure. You know, I'm reminded as you talk about this, um, what's going to happen on election day? At the same time, the supervisors have been really pushing um, vote by mail. They've also put out an all call for poll workers. We saw this beginning to emerge in March. And Jessica, I want to throw this question back to you. Um, we saw this beginning to um, emerge in March due to COVID-19, where many poll workers didn't come to the polls. And you started to see sort of a backlog in voting. And I'm wondering, you know, I know that the supervisors of elections uh, wrote the letter to Governor Ron DeSantis asked, asking for a lot more flexibility um, come August and November. Um, I'm wondering sort of what the league is doing to increase its education efforts um, and really get people paying attention. COVID has sort of sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room, but there is still an election to be had. And so what is the league doing to sort of increase awareness and, and increase transparency? Transparency and to kind of let people know, you know, here's what to expect um, when you head to the polls in August and November. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. So one thing that um, is kind of a, um, an open secret about um, poll workers and election days is that we're disproportionately reliant on retirees for um, a lot of our poll work. Um, so essentially working the polls is, you know, something you need to go to training for, you, uh, it's a full 12 hour day, uh, plus, you know, maybe even a few hours at the beginning and end, so it's a long day. Um, and then, so it's often something that, um, A, you have to have a, a passion for, but B, you have to actually have the time to do it. You have to have the time to go to the training and the, the ability to, um, you know, be there all day on election day. And so it really is something that a lot of, um, you know, appeals to a lot of retirees. And so that's also a demographic that's very vulnerable to COVID. And so we have this kind of perfect storm here where, um, you know, in order to have, um, you know, the full amount of precincts open on election day, we're really needing to have people who are very wary about going out into a, a open space or indoor space where there's going to be lots of people that they're interacting with throughout the day, right? So, um, so we are concerned about um, whether or not we're going to have across the state and across the country the number of poll workers that we need um, to really execute a, a smooth election. 
Um, so among the things that we're advocating for as an organization are an increased early voting period. Um, so of course, vote by mail is a great way for people to vote. It's a little bit more complicated than voting in person. So if you're someone who is wary of vote by mail or who, you know, that process of requesting the ballot, of getting the ballot in, you know, following the directions to a T, turning it back in, fixing a stamp, all those things, if that's something that's just, you know, a little bit complicated and there's multiple opportunities for a mistake, um, then voting in person is really a, a great way to make sure that, that your voice is heard. But we don't want to see in Florida and we don't want to see anywhere across the country those long lines of people, you know, wearing masks, not socially distancing or not wearing masks, not socially distancing, waiting in line to vote. Um, and so we're really urging in Florida, but across the, the country, um, for states to really broaden that early voting period so that you're kind of spreading out the amount of time in which people can vote. Um, and then you're also, you know, basically making it so that there's less likely to be kind of a log jam on election day. And so if you had, you know, two weeks or three weeks of early voting where people could kind of leisurely before or after work or during their lunch hour go to um, an early voting location and vote within 15 or 20 minutes and leave, you know, that's a much safer situation for poll workers, for voters, um, and it's a way to avoid kind of the complicated nature of vote by mail. So those are the things that we're, we're advocating. We definitely want access to vote by mail for folks who, you know, really feel good about that option, but we also want expanded early voting. And, you know, for, um, for election day, we do want to see as many hold, you know, precincts open as possible. Um, and so we're encouraging people to um, to volunteer to be poll workers. It actually is a paid job, so you do get paid for your time, um, but it's also um, not incredibly well paid, so it's, it's essentially a civic duty. Um, and if you're someone who feels, um, you know, healthy, you're low risk, um, and you think that's something that you would want to do to support democracy, then definitely contact uh, your local supervisor of elections and get signed up. Um, you know, in the state of Florida, I think you have up to about 14 days to start early voting in that period. I know that the supervisors um, have asked for an extended time. Um, has go the governor granted that yet? Or is that something that the supervisors are still waiting to, to see to hear back from? I have not heard that that's uh, been granted. So unless um, somebody else has any information about that, that's something that I believe we're still waiting for an answer on. Um, and we have a question coming in from our audience. Um, is there an, enough polling places? Are there enough polling places? I do know that the supervisors have asked for flexibility on that particular issue as well. Well, one of the reasons that um, we've managed to avoid having huge, I mean, well, there certainly have been a look, elections in recent memory where we've had long lines in Florida, but one of the reasons that we've been able to avoid incredibly long lines um, is because we've had early voting available as this kind of relief valve, right? It's taken the pressure off in-person uh, precincts on election day. So essentially the state population has just soared in the last two decades. But as a state, we haven't added, you know, additional precincts and ad additional polling places. So the way we've kind of been able to offset that growth is by having um, access to early voting. And so again, we would urge the governor, we would urge um, you know, the state legislature uh, to really look at that and try to figure out how to, um, how to allow people to safely vote over enough days that that can take the pressure off those, um, those polling places, those precincts on election day. You know, Steve, um, you've covered several different administrations, and I'm curious, you know, what are you hearing out of the governor's administration on this issue? Um, he hasn't said much about any sort of expectation for um, August or even November. Um, what is the conversation like? Is there a conversation? There's not enough of a conversation. Uh, what, what the governor has done is... He did not, until maybe a week or 10 days ago, he finally got around to responding to an April letter from the supervisors of election 
They wanted uh, much more flexibility in picking voting locations, and they wanted an expanding early voting period, as Jessica alluded to. They wanted to expand the early voting window from 14 days, the maximum, to 22. And Governor Ron DeSantis did not approve that request. And that has, that has supervisors that I talk to, even in Republican counties, scratching their heads. Uh, what Ron DeSantis did do is he encouraged all 67 school districts to make Tuesday, August 18th, the primary election day, a, a non-traditional school day, a teacher planning day, if you will, so that we don't have uh, students. And, and again, we have the uncertainty of even whether schools are going to be opening uh, you know, for the fall semester in any traditional sense. Certainly, that seems like much less a possibility in your big South Florida counties at the moment. Um, but um, people should be reminded that, that schools, public schools and private schools are a very important uh, source of voting in Florida elections. They're often polling sites. They're often polling sites, yes, um, on election day. And so um, early voting, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about early voting here because early voting remains popular. Um, you know, there are, there's, a, there's a, an abundant amount of research suggesting that voters are very, um, uh, the, the, the way you vote, you're a creature of habit. And, you know, we all know somebody, maybe even a family member who just likes to vote at the precinct on election day. Um, they feel like they're participating more in the electoral, electoral process if they show up and they say hi to the precinct clerk who's been at the same precinct for the last 20 years and they, they see someone they know and uh, so forth. Some people like to vote by mail, some people like to vote early. I would, if it's okay, like to ask a minor Up, oh, Steve, you're breaking up just a little bit. Can you repeat that question? Oh, okay, I, yeah, I wanted to ask Jessica Low Mine or something, and that is some of the bigger counties in the state, Broward as an example, are not providing the maximum 14 days of early voting. And the reason is because they traditionally have low primary turnouts and it's a it's a it's a cost factor. So Broward's offering nine days of early voting for the primary, but neighboring Palm Beach and Dade are both offering 14 days. I'm curious to know what the league thinks of that that decision. Jessica. Yeah. So in the past, the league has supported uh, supervisors and their you know kind of quest for flexibility in terms of early voting. I mean, they are the ones who really understand their local populations the best. Um, we, of course, are always on the side of voter access. So um, if that turns out to be, um, you know, a situation that doesn't uh, benefit Broward voters, um, then, you know, we'll, of course, be um, uh, objecting to, uh, to that. But, um, you know, supervisors do understand their local populations. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, although, it might be a good idea to allow the 14 days if they feel like, you know, hey, we very rarely see the traffic to justify that, um, and they have data to, uh, to back that up, then um, it, it could be a good decision for them, uh, given that they have a budget to maintain, they have, um, you know, staff and uh, full workers that have to be paid, and, and so, so long as it doesn't interfere with, with voter access and people are still able to get in and make their voices heard, uh, then we want supervisors to be able to exercise their um, their discretion. Blaze, um, I want to jump back to you because um, you've been quiet for a while. One of the things that you know in your reporting um, is how voting registration efforts have sort of started and stopped and started and stopped as um, you know the coronavirus has been upon us. Um, and the uncertainty around Amendment 4. And I'm wondering, you know, in the course of your reporting and the people you're talking to, where are organizations with respect to voter registration? So as far as, um, so you can, you can online register to vote. They are pushing that essentially because we're, we're, they're not certain of going door to door anymore or there aren't large events happening where a person can just show up with a bunch of papers and get people to register to vote. Um, when I was in college, people used to just 
walk up to apartments and go to their doors and say, hey, are you registered to vote here? A lot of times you're not because you're in college and so you register to vote in your new town. That's not happening. Kids aren't in school. Um, it's, I would definitely say registration efforts have died down person to person. Uh, now online, obviously it's, it's a little bit harder to track, but um, they're just using the same uh, methods almost uh, any agency would using radio ads in uh, different ways like that instead of going out and talking because uh, people aren't out and about like uh, normal. Um, and so registration during COVID-19 and also with Amendment 4 um, and that up in the air has a lot of people uh, confused on exactly how to get out and register voters. Um, a lot of times felons are very unlikely to be looking at this type of information and look this type of news because some don't even know about Amendment 4. Um, and I've been out and about with voters before COVID was uh, prevalent and, and uh, trying to register people, not me personally, but I was with Bob Radcliffe here in uh, Leon County and uh, felons told us they didn't care about voting. They cared about gun rights. Um, you know, obviously if he could vote, then maybe he could help that. But that that's just the way that uh, a lot of felons think. And I think it's just really hard unless you're meeting face to face uh, with that group of people to get really get them to go online and register. Um, definitely when the last thing they're probably thinking about is putting their name into a government system. Uh, after being locked up, I mean, most people just want to stay away from any government official business. Um, and so uh, I would say it's, it's, registration has been, and it's just from what I've seen, but I, I'd say it's definitely been down. Uh, even Bob Radcliffe, who goes door to door, he's expanding it. But I'd imagine, and I haven't spoken with him specifically, but I'd imagine uh, when I was out, some of his volunteers were older people, um, not necessarily elderly that were at risk, but I mean, the other day, an 11 year old died. So I think at this point, everybody's becoming more at risk of COVID-19 and just, you know, probably not going door to door um, as much as they were. And if they are, they're probably leaving paper on their door and just knocking. Um, it's, it's a lot different and, and it's probably driving down their numbers of certainty on who is actually signing up. I mean, if you leave a paper, does that person go turn it in? You never know. So uh, it's one of the same things like Steve was saying is, yeah, a lot of people are asking for these voter registration or for ballots to be shipped out to their house, but uh, is it gonna stay in their mailbox? Is it gonna get thrown in the trash? We don't actually know, um, but we all, we, we do know that never is it 100% of people that are registered are voting. So uh, it, it'll definitely be interesting to see when the numbers come in about how many people voted by mail uh, versus in person. It was uh, in March, it was still a good amount of people. It wasn't full, but it was a good amount of people uh, still going out and voting. Um, and that's when I spoke with Gina Grant, who's in one of my uh, stories uh, and you know, she paid off her fines, fees and restitution and was able to vote. So uh, people are still getting out and about and doing these things, but uh, just not in the large groups that you are used to seeing. You know, something to, oh. uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm Jessica. sorry, Lynn. I was just going to jump in and say, Blaze, to your point, um, you know, the League of Women Voters, we do a lot of uh, voter registration drives in high schools, and typically we do those in the spring semester, like the final kind of all, right before graduation. Um, and so obviously this year, because of COVID, schools let out early, we weren't able to get in and do those. Um, as you say, the door-to-door -door efforts, the kind of community tabling events, those large gatherings uh, here in Tallahassee, springtime Tallahassee is usually a place where the league is out doing a lot of voter registration. That event didn't happen. If you multiply that across the state and across the country, you know that's where you're seeing those new voters who just aren't being brought into the system. Um, and we've heard that voter registration is, is down about 60% um, to where it was in 2016. You know, So those presidential election years, that really is the time when new voters are brought into the process. There's a lot of energy around voter registration and voter outreach. 
um, and it's just not happening. So we're trying to do as much online, um, but I just don't see that it's yet having the same impact um, that those in-person efforts do. <coughs> You know, we're talking about registration, um, but we all know that just because you get somebody to register doesn't, excuse me, doesn't mean that you're going to get them to cast a ballot. Um, how are organizations working to counter voter apathy? Um, you have a lot of people who look at the current state of affairs and throw their hands up and say, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't, so I might as well don't. So how do you, you know, sort of counter that sentiment? Well, I think the fact that we saw people standing in line, you know, despite a global pandemic for some of these presidential preference primaries does demonstrate that people recognize that in a democracy, your vote is the way that you make your voice heard. Um, and so, yes, I know that there are always going to be voters who say, eh, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm only one person. Um, but I think the fact that people are out there voting, you know, taking huge personal risks in order to vote, um, that you see people marching in the streets over uh, social and racial justice right now. I mean, I actually think that we are going to see record breaking um, voter turnout in the 2020 election, despite everything and maybe even because of everything that's going on. People are recognizing that, um, you know, there are problems in the society and they want to elect candidates who they believe are going to make a positive impact. So, um, you know, yes, there's always um, there's always apathy. There's also a lot of misinformation out there right now. But um, I actually think that despite that, we're going to see um, huge turnout this year. You know, Steve, um, to you, you know, you talk to supervisors all over the state. Are they ready for a potentially record-breaking turnout? Um, are they prepared to be able to handle that? I think they are. Uh, but I think they also uh, hope that people will continue to take advantage of the three different ways of voting and that more people, a lot more people, will vote by mail. The supervisors, uh, Lynn, they want those votes, they want those ballots in the office, in the warehouse to be counted well before election day. This is a rough rule of thumb and it varies from county to county, but what we've seen in the last few election cycles in Florida is the following trend. Uh, a third, a third, and a third. Basically a third of those people who vote, vote by mail, a third vote early, and a third actually cast their ballot at the precinct on election day. If if the projections are right, and if what we see out on the ground so far is right, we're going to see a huge spike in people voting by mail this time compared to the other two forms of voting. Uh, what we don't know yet, again, is whether or not uh, how many of these people voting by mail are, are new voters who haven't voted before and how many are just switching the method of voting. Um, I am closely in my work for the South Florida Sun Sentinel, I'm closely following what's going on the happening on the ground, particularly in Broward and Palm Beach counties, two of the biggest counties in the state, two of the most heavily democratic counties in the state, two counties that are gonna be very important nationally in the presidential election in November. I've talked to candidates in recent days who've been telling me that, believe it or not, somebody had asked this question before, raised this point. There are, I was very surprised to hear this. There are candidates still going door to door. They're wearing masks and face coverings. They're wearing gloves. And in some cases, they are distributing literature in a clear plastic bag. The, the literature is sealed um, to maintain as much cleanliness as possible. Uh, and there have been many, many um, online virtual candidate forums, you know, um, I just hope people are paying attention and I sure hope Jessica Lowe Minor is right when she says that uh, we could be headed for a record turnout. That'd be a great thing for democracy after all we've been through this year in this state and in this country. You know, one of the things when I was talking with um, our supervisor of elections, Mark Early, um, Steve, to your point, he was talking about having more time to total up 
the vote by mail ballots. They're expecting a lot more. And that means that they're going to have to process those a lot faster. Um, there's been a lot of movement with respect to new softwares coming online that can help sort of rectify and audit ballots after the fact. Um, is that going to make a big difference to how supervisors um, address August and November? It could make a difference uh, in a very, very close race. You know, um, the supervisors don't want really close races. Uh, they, uh, um, you know, they, they want, like everybody, I think, in the democratic process, small d, they want clear, convincing results and to be in on election night. One of the problems we have in Florida is the deadlines are too close together. The, mm -hmm. um, the of, of course, well, I'll say two things. Uh, the legislature under both Democratic and Republican rule, but the Republicans have intensified it. They can't resist tinkering with the election code every year. And, uh, and they don't give supervisors enough local flexibility. Um, I'll give you one example. The state election code says that election supervisors can add one so-called wild card early voting site. There may be something peculiar about the geography and the demographics of a county where um, they don't need to have another early voting site, you know, here, they can put it over, the, over there. And um, of course, every segment of the electorate should be, should be served equally, of course. <clears throat> We've just come through this big fight in the state where the former administration of Rick Scott didn't want, didn't want early voting on college and university campuses. <clears throat> the courts, a federal court said, you must provide early voting on college campuses and that will take place this election. So um, early voting, for example, early voting must cease on the Sunday before election day. The last day you can have early voting in Florida for this primary is Sunday, August 16th. Supervisors are saying, why can't we have early voting up to and including election day? Um, they'd like to have that. So there should be a, a, additional flexibility given to supervisors. And, um, and there is, the legislature did pass a bill this year and the governor just signed to, uh, to make it easier to audit um, the results of an election. That's a good thing. And that was something that, um, you know, we got to explain this to people. Well, what we're talking about is auditing um, in a really close election. That means that numbers have to be tallied again. Um, you had difficulties, and I believe it was Palm Beach, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, where for them to have to audit the election, they had to rerun the ballot race by individual race. So that slowed them down, and it raised a lot of questions about what was going on. Um, I've heard that this new software can do sort of multiple races at one time. Um, these are all efforts on behalf of supervisors, to my understanding, to sort of increase transparency. Um, is that going to be online soon enough? I don't know the answer to that question, but I can answer the Palm Beach part of your question, Lynn, and that's true. Palm Beach had antiquated, inexcusably antiquated equipment. Uh, in the last cycle, and you're right, they could not, they could only conduct one recount of one race at one time. And uh, that's not the case anymore. The new supervisor there, Wendy Link, has all new equipment funded by the Palm Beach County Commission. It's going to be in use for this election cycle, and that's a better situation. I've spoken to supervisors in recent days about this audit, new audit software. The the difficulty with the election laws is, um, is that the audit is only done after the election results are certified. And I think there's a desire on the part of supervisors to change the law so that audits can be conducted before the election results are certified. And that's still not the case in Florida. Um, but the supervisors realize and people in, people in the wider world of election advocacy realize that changing and reforming the election laws in this state is a low, slow, long, step-by-step -step process. It takes a long time. You know, Jessica, you are an active part of that process. And I'm wondering sort of what you're seeing and what you're hearing from 
people who are looking at this and looking at the challenges, deadlines too close together, the need for better equipment, the need for more flexibility, you know, how do you convince lawmakers on both sides um, who sort of want that immediacy and want that need for now that maybe, you know, to help the system, we might need to slow down the system. Oh, Jessica, we've lost your audio. Oh, am I back? There you go. Can you, there we go. Um, so one thing that we've talked about as an organization is the need to educate lawmakers, the public, in some cases the media, um, on the, um, the reality that especially if we have a disproportionate um, vote by mail uh, participation this year, that election results just might not be ready on election night. I mean, it might take a day to several days um, to fully count every vote. Um, and we all love to stay up on election night. We all want to like be, you know, safe as they're declared um, for particular candidates. But um, in this instance, I think that we are would be doing a disservice to democracy to not acknowledge that uh, there, there might not be any uh, anything going wrong, anything fraudulent, anything problematic in any way, and it still might take three to four days to count every vote. And so um, that's something that, um, you know, we're doing a, a kind of campaign to educate our members, but also the public, um, that democracy might require patience, especially when um, we're going to be seeing an unprecedented number of vote by mail ballots, um, and to, to kind of uh, maybe plan that election night party for, for Friday, not Tuesday. <laughs> And d duly noted, um, you know, a question for all of you all here. Um, we hear a lot of conversation about stolen elections, voter fraud, um, and that comes down um, a lot of times to people who are seeing, well, the numbers look like this on election night, but then the next morning they look like this. Or, you know, they're hearing stories about vote by mail ballots being rejected. Um, you even have conversations where, um, you know, people are asking questions about, you know, how are things being counted? What are the machines doing? Um, in your respective roles as both journalists, reporters, and advocates, what are you all doing um, to sort of prime people for um, expectations in November and in August? I think the main message, Lynn, is that voter fraud is very, very, very rare. And so even though absentee balloting um, is a little more complicated, it's a bit of a, a more difficult uh, needle to thread, so to speak, um, it has been used for for decades um, and is a reliable form of voting. It's the method that we utilize to help our military vote from overseas. Um, it's the method that is uh, used, you know, most predominantly by, um, uh, you know, expatriates who are traveling, by folks who have disabilities that might have mobility issues and, and voting in person is difficult for them. Um, so there have been populations, sub, subgroups within our, our communities that have been voting by mail um, for, for decades, and it is a reliable form of voting. It's a little more complicated, it's a little more time, uh, time intensive, but, um, you know, please, if that's the method that um, you feel most uh, safe with this year, please vote, please know that your vote can be counted. And in Florida, actually, you can check to make sure that your vote was counted. Um, and that um, if there is an issue with it, if your signature was rejected or things like that, there's actually a process. You can contact your local supervisor of elections office, and there's a process that you can follow to, quote, cure your ballot and actually have your ballot counted. Um, so that gives them a further layer of peace of mind. And, you know, to Blaze and to Steve, what is the role and responsibility of journalists? Well, I, I would say uh, just basically to inform people, let them know the dates, let them know the deadlines, let them know uh, how long they have to cure things, the facts. Uh, just let them know the real facts and 
Uh, let them like like what Jessica said. Voter fraud is actually pretty rare. Um, a, a lot of times when votes don't count, that's that's not true. They they are counted, or or th that person had a chance to cure it and never came to cure it. Uh, I mean, we've seen time and time again where you know you may have two million people voting, one hundred and twenty five thousand may have voted for me. So uh, you know. It's not always the vote not counting. It's not always votes being in late or early or, you know, if, if you send your vote in, like Jessica said, you can check and see if your vote counted. If it didn't count yet, then you contact your local supervisor and find out why. If you vote early, you should have enough time before Election Day to check and see if that vote has been counted. If it hasn't, you get to that uh, polling site or whatnot. And I mean, it's it's not as uh fraudulent or as difficult as people make it seem steve yes thanks lynn uh, uh good points all i mean i would say that the, the media has a responsibility that it takes very seriously to to uh inform and to uh not let politicians pander and engage in fear mongering that's going to suppress voter turnout the best example i can think of is the president of the united states claiming that voting by mail is dangerous and is, uh, is, is not good for democracy. That's not true. Um, but let me mention something also that's, uh, that's closer to the ground. Uh, uh, the presidential preference primary, uh, which was in, on March 17th, as everyone knows, mm -hmm. ha ha happened just at the very beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. It was just starting. If you remember back that far, it seems like it was 10 years ago to some people, but there were calls on Ron DeSantis to postpone the election, and he refused to do so. The election went on, and probably at that point in time, a lot of people think maybe it should have gone on. Other states postponed their election. But what happened in that primary? It was a low turnout election, and I went back and, and did the research and pulled the numbers as anyone could. Thousands of ballots in that election, thousands of vote-by-mail ballots were invalidated and not counted oftentimes because of their mistakes by the voter, by the voter. There is a responsibility on each voter to sort of uh, do their small part to carry out their obligations and responsibilities as stewards of a free society. Three quick points about voting by mail. You must sign the ballot envelope. The signature on the ballot envelope must match the signature that the supervisor has for you on file. And I think most important, because I was so surprised to see how many voters got this wrong, your vote by mail ballot must arrive at the elections office by seven o'clock on election night. There is an exception for overseas and military ballots. They can arrive later and that's important, but that accounts for a very, very tiny fraction of the total votes cast. So remember that seven o'clock on election night is a hard deadline that applies to you, the voter, uh, to get that ballot where it belongs. That's a great point, Steve. Um, I know a lot of people think, you know, that's the mailing date, and that is not true. That is the it needs to be here date. Um, so just, you know, having people keep that in mind. We have another question coming in from our audience, and, the, and that question is, who's more consistent in voting, men or women? I can take a stab at that, Lynn. Um, the answer is clearly women. Uh, um, first of all, um, for every 100 people who vote in an election in Florida, I, I don't know about national statistics. I don't have them at the tip of my, my tongue. But I know from looking at many, many elections and analyzing the results and turnout and performance that, that roughly uh, in almost every election in Florida, uh, for every 100 people who vote, 53 or 54 of those people are women. Um, Political analysts would tell you that there's an advantage to a woman uh, being on the ballot, that voters not knowing anything about the candidates except perhaps their party affiliation and the fact that one candidate is a man and one candidate is a woman, some voters are going to be more inclined to vote for a woman candidate, uh, sensing that that candidate is more, more honest, uh, more, perhaps more family-oriented. And we're seeing, by the way, a tremendous number of women candidates running in this private cycle. 
And Steve, we launched you, but I want to pivot that question right quick to Suzanne and to Jessica. Suzanne, um, you did some interviews with women lawmakers who sort of talked about their pathway to politics. And Jessica, you're obviously with the League of Women Voters. Um, women's voices matter, and they're definitely going to matter come August and November. Yeah, um, to Steve's point, and Steve is uh, correct in this matter, as a as in almost everything. Um, but uh, it took women 60 years, but finally in uh, 1980, um, and in every election since 1980, uh, women have been the, um, the have, have outvoted men in terms of uh, percentage. So um, yes, women tend to be very dedicated and consistent voters. So we're proud of that. You know, Suzanne, to bring you back here, you know, what were some of the things that, you know, the women lawmakers you talked to um, discussed about their pathway to get to elected office? Well, I think that, um, you know, a lot of them uh, were encouraged by their family. Um, that was part of it. But they but they do realize or at least they 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 say that they realize that, you know, they know that there was a time when women did not have the right to vote and they know and understand the struggle that happened over those seven decades. And, um, you know, and it was not everybody on their side. Women were on the side of not wanting the vote, um, as well as women being on the side of, 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 of wanting to vote. So there was definitely, there were divisions within the, 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 the movements as well. Um, there were, and, and these are all things that are, are uh, focused on in the documentary, uh, you know, not only the, the the first generation of women, uh, some people may remember Ken Burns's documentary, um, Not For Ourselves Alone, which focused on uh, Elizabeth uh, Caddy uh, Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, which was sort of the first generation of women who were going after the creating the suffrage movement here in America. And then um, the, this documentary covers the second and third generations because it did take three generations from the time of Seneca Falls to 1920 um, when the, the, the certification of, the, of the, uh, the final state, which here in Florida, I mean, I think is also another thing that, that people are aware of is, is that it was not passed here in Florida until 1969. And that was a symbolic, you know, vote had already been happening for several decades, but, um, you know, it was, it didn't happen here in Florida. You know, as we reflect upon sort of the the future of voting here and, you know, the history of voting here, you know, what should people be reflecting on um, at this time? What are, what are some of the things they should be listening to or reading and just kind of, you know, getting themselves more acquainted with, you know, how far we've come when it comes to voting um, here in America? Well, I mean, from, from myself, I would say understanding the history of what's been going on. It's not been a, a, a smooth uh, road on, on that in any way, shape or form. And um, for, for African-Americans, for, for women, those, you know, there were divisions among that as well, um, you know, around the Civil War. Do they keep going for abolition or do they take a step and they try to get the right for women to vote? And then there was a struggle between that, those two different groups as well. And then once we get into the 1900s, then there's the struggle for, um, do you go for the more aggressive protesting or do you try to work within the rules of government to make it happen and i think being aware of the history of where we have been uh definitely um you know impacts of what is happening today um knowing that that you know there were people who worked very hard and tried very hard for a very long time made it their life's mission just to get the vote. And people need to understand the importance of that um, opportunity. And PBS is airing a documentary now. Yes. Right from the hers. 
Yes, uh, it's uh, it's well, the, the rightfully hers is the is the exhibit over at the Florida Historic Capitol to, uh, tonight is the vote, um, uh, which is for on American experience. It's a two night event um, starts at nine o'clock tonight. And uh, again, so part two is tomorrow night at uh, nine o'clock as well. It's two hours each night. Tonight they focus on um, from I think 19. 06 to 1915 so they sort of they they include the stuff from the beginning from the seneca falls and and things like that but they focus on um 1906 to 1915 and then tomorrow night they focus on the final five years before the before the the uh the 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 vote the amendment was ratified you know voting in this country has been sort of an evolution from you know our early founding when only white land holding men could vote to eventually African American men being able to vote to then eventually all women being able to vote. And Jessica, as you highlighted earlier, that fight continues. It is still evolving. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we um, in the League of Women Voters, we talk about this year um, not as a celebration of the 19th Amendment, but as a commemoration because the 19th Amendment, um, although it was a huge achievement, it actually didn't secure the right to vote for everyone, and it didn't secure the right to vote for every woman. I mean, actually, Native Americans in the country were not granted citizenship until four years after the 19th Amendment, and so they weren't able to vote once the 19th Amendment was passed. Um, obviously, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 helped secure voting rights, so even though, in theory, um, you know, everyone should have been able to vote after the 19th Amendment was ratified. Um, in practice, there were obstacles that were very intentionally put in the way of communities of color, especially in the South and in states like Florida, um, to prevent participation in, um, in our democracy. And so it took, you know, the continued effort and even to this day, the efforts of many um, to make sure that, um, you know, our democracy truly is free, fair and open to every citizen. You know, and Blaze, to your reporting, the newest incarnation of that, um, Florida's Amendment 4 and the fight for felons to regain their rights to vote. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's if you don't know your history, then you almost can sit down and watch it play out if you look at Amendment 4. I mean, there, the poll tax thing, I think, is something that is clearly just history repeating itself. Um, yes, it's, it's a fine fee and restitution that these people have been placed uh, upon, but now it's being turned into this thing where they have to pay it off in order to vote. Um, that right there is paying to vote. And they've, you know, ACLU and a lot of other groups are saying, hey, that's a poll tax. Uh, you can't really get around it. If you're saying they have to pay something before they can vote, that the 24th Amendment says you can't do that. Um, and like I said earlier, judges have agreed on that. Um, it's still on appeal right now, but, um, you know, it, it just shows that even though on paper something gets done, uh, you never know how somebody else may interpret it. And that's a lot, a lot of times what happens is they, they interpret certain words a different way and it can change the entire meaning, uh, a full sentence. Um, most people would say a full sentence is uh, the time period, um, but they included the fines, fees, and restitution, and that is, is sort of what's made uh, this into uh, over a year now, long battle to get uh, amendment forward to what the FRCC believes. FRRC, the Florida Rights Restoration Council. Yes, Florida yes. Rights Restoration Coalition believes is what they put on the ballot um, for felons to be able to vote once they leave prison, essentially, or out of probation, um, out of any type of, you know, no monitor on their leg, no, no parole supervisor. Once they're done with that, that's what they believed would uh, happen. But now people are being told they have to pay off fines, fees, restitution, which for, for listeners, that's not a small cost for a lot of these people. Um, sometimes it can exceed 5000 even more. Um, and this is not something that they're paying so that they could get their driver's license back. It's literally just so they can be able to vote and pay off restitution, obviously, to somebody that they may have harmed or a business could have been destroyed. You never know. But. Um, the fines and fees part is usually court fees and fines that go to pay for our court system. And, and people are arguing whether or not 
that should be something um, that they're paying for at all. And Steve, you know, as, as you recently noted, you know, check your ballot, make sure all your T's are crossed and all your I's are dotted and your signatures match, especially if you're voting by mail. And with that, I do believe that we are about out of time. Um, Blaze Ganey, thank you so much. Jessica Lominer, thank you so much. Suzanne Smith, thank you also so very much for joining us here on this Monday afternoon. Do we have any more questions from our audience? Um, any other questions for our panel? Just watch the vote, everybody. It is on this evening. It will be on PBS here on WFSU. If you're in Tallahassee, you can watch it live this evening. Um, and with that, our panel again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.